So first, welcome everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, we know this is a difficult topic for many and we're glad you could make the space to be with us tonight. I'm Lisa Falk, I'm head of community engagement for the museum. And as many of you know, the Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona and we're located in Tucson. We're situated on land that has been home to indigenous people for 13,000 years. Today, the Tucson area is home to the Otham and Pascal Yaqui, and there are 22 federally recognized tribes with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. While the museum's collections and research focus on indigenous peoples of the greater Southwest and the Northwest Mexico, we present programs exploring the diverse history and cultures of this region. These talks are offered in conjunction with our exhibit, Walking Each Other Home, Cultural Practices at the End of Life. As a member of the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership Program, over the last six years, the Southwest Folklife Alliance conducted research on end of life traditions, the ways we plan for and participate in end of life rituals, and how we mourn and honor those who have passed on. The exhibit is one way they are sharing the community knowledge that has been entrusted to them. Other related resources are also on their website. The exhibit co-curators, Leah Moss, Kimmy Isell, and I hope you have found the exhibit and related programs meaningful. We want to thank the Arizona Humanities for support of these programs so we can report to our funders and share with the speakers. We hope you will fill out the evaluation that you will receive directly after the program. I'm happy to welcome tonight's presenters whose knowledge and hearts I know will resonate with you. Sarah Asher is Associate Vice President for the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership at the United Way of Tucson and Southern Arizona. The partnership includes 18 grantee partner organizations, 29 investing partners, a core infrastructure team, and over 350 stakeholders. Sarah leads the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership in its mission to enhance the way we live by fundamentally changing the way we talk about death. The partnership's vision is to ensure people receive the care they desire at the end of their lives. It's a now, now a model of collaboration and impact. Carla Sutter, our other panelist, has a master's in social work. She's a director of Advanced Directive Registry for Conjecture. She has 30 years experience working with organizations who are dedicated to helping clients and families care for themselves and others whose needs are changing due to age or illness. And she'll be talking a little bit about what Conjecture does later on. Both are passionate about bridging the worlds of healthcare and community. And that's how we'll start tonight's conversation. I'm gonna to turn to Sarah first. Um, Sarah, could you explain to us what brought you to this work and why you were passionate about what you do? I would love to, thank you, Lisa. First, I wanna thank you and the Arizona State Museum for the opportunity to be here tonight. And, and a huge thanks to you and your team and Southwest Folklife Alliance for the amazing exhibit, just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So, um, Excited to be here and really my passion for this work arises from three different perspectives. That of my profession and my personal experiences and cultural experiences. Uh, professionally, uh, prior to this particular role, which I've been in for five years, I worked in healthcare in various roles for thir over 35 years. Um, I worked in eight different hospitals, um, all part of bigger systems. And uh, most recently led the patient experience department for three different academic medical centers, medical hospitals. And as part of that, um, the really patient experience departments focus entirely on ensuring that hospitals um, provide patient and family-centered care. Another part of that role included serving on what's called a bioethics committee, which is an interdisciplinary committee that's literally called to the table um, often urgently uh, to discuss next steps if a patient is on life support in the hospital and does not have an advanced directive. So my professional experiences have been profound and led me to my passion for this work. Personally, I've had three major death losses uh, that have uh, absolutely shaped my life, quite literally. My mom died of cancer uh, at the age of 51. 
when I was 15 years old, she chose to die at home, which at the time was really not um, a thing. She wanted to die uh, looking out at the oak tree in our backyard and was able to do that. Um, about a dozen years later, I lost a brother to suicide just prior to his 18th birthday. He um, attempted to take his life and ended up on life support for a week. And my family was um, surrounding him for that week, um, faced with some very challenging decisions. And finally, um, my father, who was diagnosed with dementia, um, had a six year journey from diagnosis to death during which I was his caregiver and legal guardian. Last but not least, um, I'm drawn to this work culturally. Uh, I've always been really passionate about community, um, have served on a number of nonprofit boards. Um, and I grew up in New Orleans. I was born and raised there um, where we have rich traditions around death and joyful living, joie de vivre. Um, and by the way, happy Mardi Gras, today's Mardi Gras. Um, so this is really my dream job, merging the worlds of community and healthcare, really to start speaking a common language for those two worlds. And that would be a language really of humanness. So first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be um, part of this conversation. Um, I think you'll hear um, some real similarities in terms of what Sarah shared um, as well, uh, that you cannot be working um, at uh, the topic of end of life, um, both just from a professional perspective, uh, because of course, we all are shaped by our own personal um, experiences. You know, as we talk later about um, having conversations of this, it is striking for me that my family was always very open about topics that often were um, not things that people would talk about, particularly in the um, age that um, I grew up. Um, and death was something we talked about regularly, unfortunately, experiencing death of family members um, as a child um, required us to have open conversations. And so I've always had a comfort with the um, discussion around end of life. Um, and this was then translated into my work as a social worker um, in, in over 30 years of that, but um, particularly my work as a hospice social worker. And a couple of things that really kind of guided me is one, first recognizing, because I, I was with so many families and, and clients at end of life, that when you have met one person, um, no matter if they're experiencing the same illness um, that ends their life, you have met one person. And so the idea of ensuring that people have choice, people have a voice in whatever way that is, um, is so key to honor. Uh, culture and faith and belief systems. Um, my own personal around these documents um, was my dad who passed um, six years ago. And as a family who talked about this a lot, um, he had his documents completed. But I will share that even though I have a great comfort around end of life conversations and talking with hospital uh, staff and making those decisions, having those documents for him, being able to go back to those afterwards to know that I really honored his decisions was really key for me. And it's something that I want others to be able to experience um, for themselves. And I had shared a story with the two of you as we were preparing for this that I think also really um, shows for me why this is so key, because it was such a powerful experience for a family that I worked with. Um, a daughter was being asked by the hospital team if they wanted her father who had advanced uh, dementia and was having um, numerous episodes of what's called aspiration pneumonia due to his illness. They wanted to know if he they should put a feeding tube in. And the daughter turned to me and said, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what my dad would, would want. I knew that there was a living will that her father had completed. And so I asked her to read that again. 
And after she read the document, she came back and I said, do you know what your father would want? And she said, absolutely. Now, I know that that document never used the term dementia. It never talked about a feeding tube. It never talked about aspiration pneumonia. But the power of his words, even though they were not coming from him in that moment, allowed her to know what was important for him and what decisions should be made. And having that, and this was 15 plus years ago, that, that story, but I can remember it so clearly, is really what guides me in the work that um, I do today. Um, and that we'll talk about as we move forward. How does your passion align with the work of your individual organizations and the goals and objectives of those organizations? As uh, Sarah, I think, talked about having her dream job, this was uh, my dream job to be able to be with Contextor and, and be directing the Arizona Healthcare Directives Registry, which uh, Contextor is the home for, for this registry. Contextor is uh, what's called a health information exchange organization. Uh, the focus for this nonprofit organization that is the um, recognized health information exchange in Arizona is to advance individual and community health and wellness through the delivery of actionable information as they share um, information between over um, 1,100 healthcare providers throughout the state um, to share what is uh, historical health information with other providers to be able to then assist um, in the um, care. The Secretary of State um, had held the Advanced Directive Registry um, since 2004. And in 2019, there was a legislative change that um, based on wanting to make these documents in the registry more useful to um, healthcare providers across the state, um, they transitioned that to Contextor to be the home. And we now have the Arizona Healthcare Directives Registry. That registry was developed with the focus of um, organizations across the state who recognize that the importance of these documents is not just in the words of the document themselves, but only when they are viewable by healthcare providers at the time they are needed. And so having this registry is both focused on ensuring that documents are completed, advanced directive documents that have the information of what someone's choices and wishes are, but as important is to then be able to have those documents when and where they are needed in a healthcare crisis. Because as we all know, um, and, and I experienced this myself when I went to find my documents to put them into the registry when we began, um, my house was in disarray to a plumbing catastrophe. I could not find those documents. And I recreated them to make sure that they were in the registry. I will share that I've not found those documents ever. Um, so wherever they went, um, they were not available. But I now know that those documents are not only available to me if I ever want to make changes, but they're available to both my healthcare agents and my family if they need to view them um, in an emergency, and as importantly, or most importantly, to my healthcare providers. And so that's what brings me to this work and, and the company Contextor and the AZHDR is really the mainstay here in Arizona to be able to um, ensure that this is happening. Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership? I'd love to do that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about my organizations with an S because the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership is anchored uh, at United Way of Tucson and Southern Arizona, which is a non-direct service providing organization that acts as the backbone or the infrastructure for the partnership as the whole, as a whole. Um, and the mission of United Way of Tucson and Southern Arizona is to build a thriving community by uniting people, ideas, and resources. And that's exactly what the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership does. Um, it is a true partnership. Um, we create, we created, uh, collaboratively created our mission and vision and uh, work together on our strategy and building the partnership as a whole. Our vision, our partnership vision is to ensure that people receive the care they desire at the end of their lives, also known as goal concordant care with the goals of the person and family at the center. Um, in order to do that, in order to achieve our vision, 
we have to really address the root cause for why why those goals haven't been concordant um, as often as we would like in our country for many, many years. And so we need to address the root cause of that issue, which is that many people aren't comfortable talking about death. So we have to, <clears throat> excuse me, normalize these conversations, demedicalize these conversations, and overall get more comfortable talking about death and dying um, because we're all going to experience it someday. Hence, the, the mission of our partnership is to enhance the way we live by fundamentally changing the way we talk about death because we, we believe strongly that the more we talk about what matters most to us at the end, the more we will prioritize those things as we live every single day. Thank you, Sarah. And there, the websites for both their organizations are in the chat. You can copy them or click on them. It'll take them to them. Um, so I'm going to continue on with the conversation and, and ask something that's really hard for all of us. When is the right time to have this conversation with your loved ones? And how, how, do, how do you start the conversation? Uh, Sarah, do you want to start addressing that one? Sure. Um, I'd start by saying... Uh... The right time is whenever it's right for you um, and to trust your gut, trust your instincts. Um, but I would add to that about uh, in terms of the right time uh, that it's really never too early. I started talking to my own kids who are now in their mid twenties when they were preschoolers, um, talking about death as a normal part of life. And like many people uh, first talked about it in response to loss um loss of pets grandparents aunts uncles and friends both of my daughters actually lost friends um, at a very young age in terms of how to start the conversation um the the answer to that is it depends it depends on whom you're talking to um if you're talking if you're trying to learn what's most important to someone else um, I really like starting the conversation by just asking the question, what matters most to you in living your life every single day? And saying that it's important to know that in case I need to be your voice. Um, so it's a positive way to frame it. Um, and again, helps us prioritize those things every single day of our lives. Um, I think if you want to talk about your own wishes to your family members, um, especially to the person you choose uh, to speak for you, if you can't speak for yourself, um, again, it depends on your relationship. Um, my, like, like Carla, my family was pretty open about talking about death. And uh, my closest friends and siblings and I our like-minded souls were, were generally pretty direct communicators about such things. So uh, it's not that difficult for us to talk about it. Um, interestingly, even though my kids are comfortable talking about death in general, because we started those conversations at such a young age, when it comes to talking about my death, uh, they're not as comfortable. Um, they, they're not as likely to jump in and, and continue the conversation. And I think part of that is the emotion um, that's attached to that conversation. So it's a it's a great question because I do think it's it's probably one of the biggest reasons that, you know, not only us personally don't always have these conversations, but you know, even medical professionals who are working with individuals um, often don't know when to start the conversation. The first thing I'll, I'll share, and, and both Sarah and I have shared a little bit about our family and, and the um, openness of communication, but it's really important to understand your own legacy of communication in your family, that everybody has a different style. Um, so as we share information, you know, it really has to be translated into what works for, you know, your family structure. And when I say family, that could be your, your, your friend group, it could be, you know, um, an intimate partner, it could be a, you know, generational uh, family 
family member. Um, but really thinking about, you know, who within the family has often been the one who brings up difficult topics, whether it's about, you know, needing to make a move or finances or anything, you know, kind of guiding it as to maybe that's the best person to have these conversations. So sometimes these conversations, again, we can take it out of the personal and have it with the person who may be the start, best lead. The other piece that I think is so key, and, and over my career, I've often had family members come to me and say, can you come in and tell my mom, my dad, who, whomever is the patient, the identified patient, that they need to do X, Y, Z. And I will say, I will come in, but we're not going to start the conversation in that way. And really what I think is important with these documents is we should never ask individuals to complete these documents if we ourselves have not thought it's important enough to complete them. These documents are for all of us. If for anyone over the age of 18, as we'll talk about a little later in, in the, the discussion. Um, so it's a great way to say, you know, I just listened to this conversation. I just listened to a podcast. I was watching a movie. Um, and this experience um, kind of got me thinking that these are documents maybe I want to complete. Would you be interested in joining me um, and, and learning about this? Would you want to come over and we can do these together? Again, if we bring it in that way, then that person who is really maybe in need because things are going to be changing quicker for them, maybe because of a diagnosis or their age, they will feel that this is not something that they have to do because of being thought of as you know, feeble or because they are less than and you're going to take over and control, but they will see that you find the value in it. Um, so again, using stories outside of the personal is often really helpful, um, even if you kind of tweak and make a little um, what I call a benevolent lie. Um, maybe you don't have a friend at work who found herself in a situation that needed these documents, but somebody has a friend at work that found themselves in this situation. So you can kind of make that story that you believe is going to connect with the person that you're having that conversation with. Um, and recognize when's a good time, when's not a good time. Uh, is it better to do this in your, your home? Is it better to be out in um, more of a public setting to start these conversations? And not every conversation is going to end with a completed document. But every conversation will provide more detailed information that's really going to help the next step. Thanks. And before we um, go to the next question, um, I wanted to point out Darlene put in the chat some resources that we're going to be talking about, but I'm going to also put in the chat, I want to turn it to you all, my audience, and ask how might you start the conversation, having heard Sarah and Carla's suggestions and, and insights from their work, how do you think you might start this conversation with a friend or loved one? I really liked the suggestion that oh, I just read a book and it was dealing with this or I saw a movie because it kind of takes it away from, well, we have to talk about this <laughs> you know, for me because it is it is hard. I've tried to bring it up and these are those are good suggestions. Anybody else have an idea? Yeah, Grieving in the Brain book um, is a kind of good conversation starter. We had the author um, give a little talk about that at our public program. All There Is podcast um, is being recommended. All There Is with Anderson Cooper. Darlene put the link in the chat as well. Ask if somebody else has ever made a decision for, for someone else. If that, you know, that, that's good. How do you feel, how do you feel about that? You're right. Um, asking if you have any ideas or if you could choose or think about where would you want to die? Like Sarah's mom wanting to die at home, looking at the oak tree. I love that visual. I think these are wonderful um, examples. I definitely um, love that people are kind of opening up and sharing some of their own personal um, things that is important to them. And that's a great way to just start a conversation, you know, just kind of thinking about um, 
something. And, and there's always stories that are making, you know, kind of from a, a cultural uh, perspective, you know, um, that you can pull from what's happening in our life to be able to bring it into um, these conversations um, as well. I agree. I love these suggestions. And I think they also really illustrate how person centric it is, you know, all of all of these conversations and the way we approach things are about being our authentic selves. Um, Carla, somebody in there mentioned the five wishes. Could you tell us a little bit about what types of documents are available to communicate healthcare wishes and preferences? So I'm going to share first the, um, in Arizona, there are four types of documents that um, are known as advanced directive documents. Um, I will also share that if you are out of state, every state has pretty much the same um, types of documents. They may have slightly different uh, names and documents from one state, um, as long as they have been completed in the way that that state requires them, can be used here in Arizona. So we'll kind of start there. But in Arizona, the four types of documents, and these may be individually done, or they may be all one document with different um, parts to it. Um, but those are a living will. And a living will is, I like to think about it as kind of your, your map of what um, you would want um, at the end of life. The healthcare power of attorney is a document that allows you to not only share what you would want from some of your treatment um, and healthcare, but also to name your person. Who would you want to be, not necessarily think about them as your decision maker, but think about them really as your voice for decisions that you have made and had conversations with them about. The In Arizona, there's also a separate document or part of a healthcare power of attorney, which provides for mental health care. And this would be if somebody is needing behavioral inpatient treatment. And so there has to be a specific designation for that type of treatment on these documents. The final type of document, and again, you can complete one or all four of these, um, is the what's called a pre-hospital medical care directive, um, also known as an out-of-hospital DNR. Some people may know it by its color of the form, which is an bright orange uh, document. And that's a document that guides first responders and emergency personnel to whether or not you would want um, resuscitation if you are experiencing um, a, a cardiac episode. Um, that document does not say that you will not get treated even if you do not want to be resuscitated. They will still treat you. They will still provide support. They will still take you to the hospital if it is for something other than the resuscitation piece. So there's four types. In Arizona, there's also what's known as a medical order, but it is a post document. It's a portable um, treatment document. And typically that's gonna be for individuals who have a more advanced um, diagnosis. Um, with uh, specific guides to treatment. I think the most important thing when we talk about these documents is to understand that these are documents of choice and not of limitation. I never want people to think that there is a certain way that these documents need to be completed. These are based on what honors your, your personal uh, beliefs, your mission statement of your life, your culture, your faith. There's documents that can be guided in that way. The, for instance, the Catholic Diocese has a document for advanced directives that, that is guided by the faith tenants. Um, these documents in Arizona can be on any form type. So there are multiple versions of a living will, multiple versions of what would be considered a healthcare power of attorney. If you wanted to write it on a legal pad or a, a newspaper, uh, newspapers are hard, you can't see between the words, but a, a napkin and you write living will and you write your wishes and then you sign it, date it and have it witnessed. 
it is going to act as a living will. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. And I know in a few minutes, Sarah is going to talk a little bit about one of the documents that was mentioned. If nothing else, I think sometimes we get so um, encumbered by how many different documents there are that we kind of become paralyzed by. I, it's too many forms. It's too many lines to complete. We kind of um, right now this year with the Arizona Healthcare Directives Registry is really focused on what we're calling choose your person campaign. If you do no other document, then choose and document the person that you want to be your voice for your decisions. That is a key place to start. It's often the best place, particularly for people who are healthy, because it's sometimes hard to think about what would I want at my end of life when I may be in my healthiest state. There's a, a blog article that's on our AZHDR website that was actually written by my daughter who's 29 and her experience as a young person as to completing these documents and, and that experience. So there's many different types of documents in Arizona to be a legal advanced directive. Again, it needs to name the type of document you as the principal sign it, you date your signature, and your signature has to be witnessed or notarized on the same date, and that is a um, valid document. There's a way then to take those documents and also register them with the AZHDR so that they are more accessible to healthcare providers across the state. And that information can be found on what to do in terms of the registration. So we won't confuse the, the talk, but I do want to make sure people do understand that there's a way to then register um, those documents. So I hope if you have questions on those, please feel free to um, add them into the chat and we'll talk about those um, as we move forward. But I really want Sarah to be able to share because it's been talked about a document that's, that is well known here in the state that can be used as well. So I, I wanna just start by reiterating something that Carla just said, and that is if you do nothing else, the, the, the most important thing you can do is choose the person who will speak for you if you can't speak for yourself. So choose your healthcare proxy and choose a backup proxy or two backup proxies. Um, it's really impossible to know the detailed circumstances of our deaths. We just don't know when or how or where it's going to happen. And as a result, um, we have to really carefully choose the person who will speak for us um, because we can't outline every single detail of what might happen. Uh, and practically speaking, when you, when you think about who you're choosing, um, who will speak for you, be sure to choose someone who will know or listen to your values and what matters most to you. Um, choose someone who's comfortable advocating or speaking up on your behalf. Choose, um, make sure your family members know who you've chosen because we've heard lots of stories about family members being surprised that they weren't chosen as the healthcare proxy. So make sure those conversations happen ahead of time. And then just really practically speaking, choose someone who's gonna answer their phone <laughs> or be easily accessible. That person needs to be able to be reached. Um, so all of that said, um, I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, well, on our website, we've got links um, to uh, Health Current and to the registry uh, QR code and to different documents uh, that Carla's already uh, talked about. Um, but we also have um, five wishes available um, on our website. So you, you are able to obtain a, a copy of five wishes on our website. The reason we like um, to recommend starting with five wishes is because five wishes um, is a living will and it also includes, um, there are sections on medical, um, personal, emotional and spiritual needs that you um, are prioritizing. And the five areas that are um, 
focused on in this document are number one, the person who will speak for you, two, the medical uh, treatment that is desired or not. And what I love about it is it actually presents different, um, has different choices, different paragraphs, and you can literally just scratch them out if you um, don't want that particular um, item or choice. Three, how comfortable you want to be at the end of your life and specifics about that. Four, um, how you want people to treat you um, in terms of family, culture, faith traditions. Um, and five, uh, last and certainly not least, what you want loved ones to know. Um, things like how you know what kind of funeral you want what kind of burial you want what kind of legacy you'd like to leave um so it's really um it's a it's a document that's easy to understand um it's in 30 different languages um the reading level is very simple it's it's not uh medicalized or or uh full of legalese in fact when it was created um healthcare professionals were consulted as were attorneys and how to make it really understandable. So um, I encourage you to at least take a look at it. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and I wanted to ask others, if you have questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A would be preferable, but either place is fine. Um, but as, think about as a result of attending tonight, if there's something new or different you will do as it relates to your end of life care planning. Did, did this conversation um, impact your thoughts in that way at all? And while you're thinking about that and perhaps answering that in the chat, somebody was wanted to list out what those four types of documents were. Um, the healthcare POA, well, the mental health care POA, the pre-hospital medical care director directive. What are, what were the other ones? So Carla talked about the living will, and uh, five wishes is a living will, um, and uh, health care power of attorney, which is health care proxy. Who's your person? That's also part of of five wishes, but it can be a, another document. Um, and Carla. Um, talked about the mental health power of attorney, um, the DNR, do not resuscitate, and then um, the POST form, which is the form, um, the physician form. Right, and if you go to the Contexture website, which is in the chat, the link there, um, you'll find links to there, and at the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership website, you'll find links to a variety of documents and resources. As and well. Marilyn, um, as hot, we've got links to um, the Hospital Association website on our End of Life Care Partnership website also. And they have trainings, they have Pulse trainings. Um, and and I think those um, trainings are listed on the ASHA calendar. So you, um, the Pulse document, as I shared, is a medical order. It's not considered an advanced directive. It can be held within the registry if it accompanies another document. It really is kind of a progression in some ways that when you complete your healthcare power of attorney and then your living will, it kind of guides the Pulse document, which really is much more around um, specific uh, treatments and interventions. So it's really talking much more around um, your choices for resuscitation, for intubation, for utilization of certain medications, for if you are choosing a more palliative kind of approach or if you want to remain out of the hospital. And so a lot of times the conversations kind of lead up into that. And as I shared earlier, oftentimes that document is going to be for individuals who are in more advanced um, age or illness where there is a higher recognition from the healthcare provider that you are in an advanced state. That document, unlike the other advanced directive documents, does need to be signed by a healthcare um, uh, 
provider, as does the DNR document. So those two documents have a little different that they do have to be signed by a healthcare provider because you're they're really going to want to talk with you a little bit more about what it means in your specific medical care um, versus the other documents, which can be more holistic in nature in terms of not just talking about medical interventions, but really around healthcare and where and kind of place of care. Carla, there's a kind of follow-up question to that, wondering if you've ever heard of a time when a DNR or medical directives are not followed uh, due to unusual circumstances of some sort. So I can't really speak to that directly, not being within those health settings. Um, it's why, though, those documents are um, do have healthcare provider signatures so that there is a kind of a better understanding of all parties as to where somebody's, um, you know, wishes stand. And so gives the opportunity, particularly because those types of decisions um, often are very clear and will kind of delineate what will happen if they are followed. Um, it's really important to make sure that family members understand where you are with that. Um, it is, you know, um, any medical center does need to let you know if there is a reason for any that they would not be able to follow um, your medical uh, wishes. I would add that in terms of DNRs not being followed, uh, the most practical reason and, and probably uh, the most common reason would be that they are not accessible. Um, and the default for any healthcare provider is um, going to be to save your life. So that's the default. And if, if that document is not easily accessible quickly and immediately, um, they're going to go into life-saving mo mode. Yeah. And, and I'll follow up on that as, as Sarah was sharing, and that's really good um, information to, to um, share. There is a, often a misunderstanding that just because your living will states, for instance, that you would not want to be resuscitated in you know, certain situations, that document is not going to be followed by first responders. They can only follow what's considered a medical document that is signed by a medical provider which is why that orange form does need to be accessible to them, either in paper or viewable in another manner, um, or a wallet card that has the DNR uh, orange uh, wallet card as well. So people often misunderstand that you can have your healthcare agent kind of tell the person, uh, no, she doesn't want this, um, but they can't follow the agent in the community setting. When you go into a hospital setting, that does change in terms of those documents. But it, that's why the pre-hospital medical care directive is key if you do not want to be resuscitated under circumstance. And, and before you make that decision, um, I would really highly encourage you to have a, a conversation with your medical provider um, yes. about, about those scenarios and um, get more information about it. So someone's a little confused. They want to know, do all the documents need to be signed by a healthcare provider with the exception of your living will? No, only the only documents that are signed by a healthcare provider would be a pulsed document or the orange pre-hospital medical care directive. The other documents do not need to be signed by a healthcare provider in any manner. Okay. And a couple of people have asked, um, having turned in my end of life care documents to my hospital and PCP, is there, are they automatically added to the Arizona registry? Or if not, you know, how, how do they get into it? And also, if is there a way to check if you think they were in your old system to make sure they're in the current system? So great questions. Um, if you did have documents that were with the Secretary of State, or you believe that you had documents within the Secretary of State Registry and you want to check if they are have been transitioned, you can um, reach our contact numbers are on our website at azhdr.org and you can call and provide some information and we can um, 
review to see and then send you information on how you can sign into your account. We can send that out again to the address on file. If they were not transitioned for whatever reason, um, because maybe the, the address that we sent the original notification of the transition um, was no longer accurate, um, we can then share with you the steps to get those documents into the registry. While all of the hospitals are getting signed up in the state to be have access to the registry, um, it is a consumer guided program. So the consumer or their agent need to complete the registration agreement. Um, and while the hospital or health provider can upload documents for you on your behalf, you would need to say that you want these documents into the registry. And so um, that information is on the website. And any questions you have, we have um, support team members that are available um, by phone and email to answer these questions if you don't feel like the information you're getting on our website is giving you what you need. Lisa, I, would, I wanna respond to a, a, a question in the chat about getting support for uh, supportive conversations regarding this process um, and not feeling alone in the process. And that it, on our AC end of life care um, website, we have a list of workshops you can attend. There are free workshops available to guide you in this process. Um, and we have a calendar of events and also um, quite a few of our partners offer, our partner organizations offer one-on-one -on -one sessions if you're more comfortable with that. So um, feel free to reach out, look at our website, look at our partner organizations, or just give us a call and we'd be happy to guide you. Very good. And I see one final question is, where do you get a DNR wallet card? Is it available online or do they have to ask their healthcare provider? So the um... The Attorney General uh, site um, has at azag.gov, that's azag.gov, if someone wants to type that into the chat, um, you can get the life care planning packet, and within that is the orange DNR form. Um, it will give you information. There is not a wallet card um, uh, like template, Basically, it will say that the information on the uh, that pre-hospital medical care directive that's at the attorney general site needs to can be shrunken down to be in a wallet form. It does also need to be on orange paper. If you have questions, you can also talk to the team at the attorney general's life care planning um, department. And all of and the attorney general site is also on our website, as is the contexture site. So if you only want to go to one website, you can go to our website and we have all of these links there. So if anybody, I'm going to give it one more minute to if anybody has a further question to type it in the chat or the Q&A, um, we can ask it, Sarah and Carla, are there anything else you would like to add to the conversation? So I, I guess my last point will be, there's a lot of information that we're shared tonight. And I know that people are coming to this um, for lots of different reasons. Um, many that are just experiencing some really emotional um, kind of tumultuous times that have brought you to this. Just know that again, take time, read the information. There's lots of support uh, teams around the state to be able to assist in, in different ways with questions. Um, and, and again, just take it one document at a time um, and not feel like you have to do everything all at once. Um, just start with some conversation, get to know um, what people um, around you that are important um, about this and, and start the conversation. You'll probably be really surprised, um, as my daughter shared, what a really amazing experience it was um, talking with the person that um, you know she thought she knew everything about, um, but they really had some great conversation and she felt so much more confident about knowing that she could honor what he wanted um, after that. So I just, I want to honor everyone for taking time um, to, to going through and, and starting this process. 
I'll just end with, you know, really, we, we like to talk about six steps in this process. And again, starting with the, the, the number one priority, which I know Carla and I both agree on is choose your person, choose, choose the person who will speak to you. Um, if you can't speak for yourself, that's step number one. Um, two, think about what matters most to you. So number three, talk about your preferences. Number four, write down your wishes. Don't, don't forget to write them down. Number five, store the documents and, and, and upload them into the registry. Um, give copies to your healthcare provider, to, to your proxies, to your family. And finally, review and revise um, on a regular basis um, when you have changes in your life. I'm, I'm redoing mine right now because I'm planning to, to travel and I've um, switched around my, my, my proxy. So I've had to make some calls this week, which is really good practice. So with that, I think we've gone through all our questions. And just to remind everybody, the um, Arizona End of Life Care Partnership and Conjecture has their websites have links to all of this and more. Um, and again, the exhibit that the Arizona State Museum and Southwest Folklife Alliance created to help people begin to think about and talk about these issues um, is only up through Saturday. So if you have not seen it or would like to see it again, please do come by the museum before four o'clock Saturday. <laughs> okay. It's beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for uh, making space to talk with us tonight. And specifically, thank you for Carla and Sarah for the work you do on behalf of all of us in the state of Arizona and elsewhere. So thank you. Thanks everyone.